Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for this special question and answer session for National Science Week 2021. This year the theme of National Science Week is food different by design and in this event we're going to be looking at tuna and the journey of our fish from the boat to the plate. Hopefully you've been able to have a look at the worksheet for this session and started thinking about some of the questions that you have for our special guests. Today we'll be receiving questions via Mentimeter so you can send your questions to speakers at menti.com and type in the code that you'll see up on the screen here, 61137934. Today, we are joined by Phil Ravanello, who is up on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. Phil is the program manager of Tuna Australia and can answer all of your questions about tuna in the ocean, how we catch them and what happens on their journey from the boat to the shop. Hi, Phil. Hi, how are you? We're also joined by Grant Lowe, who is the owner of a very popular fish shop in Wollongong in New South Wales called Harley and John Seafood, which is MSC certified sustainable. Grant can tell you about how he sources sustainable fish, what happens to the fish once they arrive at the shop, and how they can be filleted and cooked. Hi, Grant. Hi. Now I will hand you over to our host. She is a science communicator with a background in marine biology, a presenter and a model, Laura Wells. Hi, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our lovely talk about tuna. How exciting. And I hope you're all doing well working from home or wherever you are today tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Now we are going to start with a little thought starter for Phil today. Tuna are the race cars of the ocean and can swim at speeds of up to 65 kilometers an hour. That's really, really fast. There are more than a dozen species of tuna around the world. In Australia, we usually eat skipjack or yellowfin tuna, which are a little more sustainable to fish um, and to other types of tuna like bluefin tuna. But Phil, I want to know what is your favorite type of tuna? Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, my favourite tuna is actually the big eye tuna. Um, it's one of the largest species that we catch in Australian waters. It basically, looks like a big, big beer barrel with a fin, uh, with a tail. It's um, they grow to about 185 centimetres long and about 180 kilos. Um, I've seen them up to about 110 kilos. Um, they're a really cool looking animal. Um, they're really good to eat too. Um, we like to have them just sashimi with soy sauce and wasabi, um, and they're also really good in poke bowls as well. Amazing. So that's a really, really big fish, like huge fish. I don't think anyone can actually fathom how big that that fish is in our ocean. That's incredible. All right. I am going to throw over to a student poll. I want to know if any of you have ever seen a tuna. Have you seen a tuna in a can, in a fish shop, in the wild, or have you never seen a tuna before? You can enter your... uh, answer over at menti.com and use the code 61137934. We're getting people already putting their answers in. A lot of people have seen their tunas in a can, also in a fish shop. That's pretty cool. And even in the wild, you guys must have, were you underwater or did someone catch one? That's really interesting. Uh, I feel like most people are going to have seen their tunas in a can. But Phil, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. You work with fishing and actually trying to catch tuna. What are the ways in which you actually catch tuna? Okay, the main method that we use to catch tuna is is, um, by using what's called um, a long line. Um, So it's a really long line, sometimes up to 100 kilometres long. And we have hooks off them, um, sometimes up to two and a half, three thousand hooks, which are baited with squid. Um, And they're set out in the ocean and set to drift with the currents and um, and that's how we catch them. Um, because they're pelagic species, they're never in the same spot at the same time. So there's a bit of an artistry in working out where they are. And we use things like current breaks and temperature um, changes in the water and altimetry. So those sea surface height anomalies to work out where the fish are. Where, and that's where we decide where to set our lines. 
Unreal. So a really, really long line with lots and lots of hooks on it to try and catch a lot of tuna, obviously. And you mentioned just then that tuna are pelagic fish, which means they live in the ocean and in all levels of the water column. But is it true that tuna actually migrate? They go to different oceans and different areas at different times? Yeah, so most of the fish that comes to the east coast of Australia um, has come in from the Western and Central Pacific. So they basically swim in that big, broad area of the Pacific Ocean, and they'll come in at certain times of the year um, and at certain types of currents and, and will come into the zone, use the currents to cruise up and down the east coast of Australia and then get spat back out of the zone. So as I said, they're never in the one place at the one time. So from day to day, trying to find them is, is what we try and do and specialise in. Right, so are there fishermen that just specialise in catching tuna? Because it sounds like they're really hard to find in these huge oceans, especially when they're moving around. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a niche fishery. Um, when we're fishing for tuna, we, we basically catch nothing else but tuna. Um, sometimes we'll get some, some swordfish or marlin as well as bycatch and a few other smaller pelagic species like mahi-mahi. But predominantly, our boats are only set up to target tuna species. Um, it's a very specific okay. fish. Right. Uh, so we've just finished up with our poll and I can see that 59 people have only ever seen tuna in a can, which makes sense. A lot of us would have tuna in a can in our house, in our cupboards at home. Grant, you own a fish shop. Yeah. I'm guessing you've, only, you've uh, seen tuna in a lot of different ways, not just in a can. Do you sell tuna in your store? Yeah, we definitely do. So we get in the whole tuna off the fishermen. We break it down um, into the loins and then, yeah, people have it with their sushi, cook it. Um, yeah, lots of different ways to, to have it. And I understand that tuna is a little bit different to some of the normal kind of types of fish we see. A lot of the fish we see have a white body, but that's not the case with tuna, right? No, that's correct. So it's a, a pinkish flesh. Um, reddish, just depending on the fish as well, they do change definitely in colour. Um, yeah, albacore tuna is a really, really light coloured flesh. Um, but then, yeah, your, your tunas, your bluefin tunas, yeah, really dark red. Right. And from what I know, guys, that the colour of the tuna itself is actually because it has more of a chemical inside it that holds onto oxygen because these fish swim so fast they need to use up a lot of oxygen to grow that muscle and swim really fast they're an amazing species now Grant you mentioned that you sell tuna and you get in the whole tuna so that means you get it from head down to tail and you chop yep. it up now most people would buy it as a fillet and take home the fillet of fish, but is there a lot of waste product from fish, especially tuna, that people don't eat? Look, there is a little bit of waste. Um, we've got some great customers and they'll take the whole head, they'll take um, the tail, they'll smoke it. Um, so, yeah, look, there is a little bit of waste, but we try to use everything possible. Right. And what can people do at home to try and use everything possible of the fish? Can they actually buy the fish heads from you? Yeah, yeah definitely. So they'll come in and buy it and we can cut them up and boil it, make stocks, um, all the bones, um, a lot of our fish bones. So we reuse them. We give them to our lobster fishermen. So they go back and um, use them to actually catch catch lobsters. So very little actually goes in the bin. If not, we actually use... We've got a few gardens that, um, like community gardens, they come and make um, compost out of the fish bones. So yeah, very, very little of it. So that's one thing that we pride ourselves on is um, not, not throwing any, anything in the bin. Unreal, that makes, it helps to make the fisheries more sustainable as well. Uh, Phil, I wanted to ask you, how many, do you know how many species of tuna there actually are? We've had that question from, someone that's tuned in uh, globally there's around 15 or 16 different tuna species um, we generally see there's four commercially valuable species in australia which is the albacore tuna the big eye the yellow fin and at certain times of the year the southern bluefin tuna there are also a number of smaller tunas which are inshore species like long tail tuna and mac tuna 
they're generally not targeted by um, commercial fishermen, but they're really cool recreational targets, for example. So I do a little bit of fly fishing for long tail tuna, which is which is really cool fun. So they do come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, as I said, from 180 kilos all the way down to two or three kilos. They're a really fascinating species. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's so much diversity within tuna itself. Most people would only think there's only one type of tuna, the one you get in a can, but we actually... 15 different species all around the world. That's really cool. I love it. Um, I wanted to know, Phil, are tuna in danger in any ways? All the species that are in um, the Australian fishing zone are, aren't in, in any danger, but there is a certain amount of illegal overfishing that happens in certain parts of the world. Um, we're really lucky in Australia that we've got really awesome fisheries management. So there's all these strategies in place like stock assessments and stuff like that to really keep like a good eye on the stocks to make sure that they are sustainable. Yeah, it's, um, fishery science is a very interesting and complex world. Um, it's a bit like farming, except you can't see your sheep in the paddock or you can't see your trees growing in the, in the paddock. So um, it's not an exact science, but the scientists have got it down to a pretty good art. Yeah, it is so different to be able to manage the fish to make sure that they're sustainable for the future because we can't see what's under the surface like we can on a farm. So fishery scientists have a very hard job, but I guess it's up to everyone to do their part. And just like you catching the tuna, you would more than likely have to give in the data and how many fish you actually catch. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So our fishermen fill out logbooks for every time that they deploy their long line and pull it in. And the other thing is, that they fish to a quota. So the scientists set the total amount of fish that's allowed to be caught in any given year. And then we go out and as long as we're catching underneath that amount each year, we can be certain that the stocks are sustainable and still in the water for the next, for the next year and the year after that and into the future. That's great. So we're helping to preserve our fish stocks for the future to make sure that we have tuna absolutely forever. I love it. Uh, I do have another question for you, Phil. Why do we put tuna in cans? And that's from Amani, who's 10 years old. She's asked that question. Okay. Um, a lot of the tuna that go into cans are low value species, such as your skipjack tuna. Um, they're quite easy to catch in large quantities and they are very sustainable. They're very fast growing and they spawn basically constantly. So there's this constant supply. It's a really good, cheap source of protein. Um, and the way that it's handled is differently to the way that you would um, that you would handle, say, a big eye or a yellowfin tuna for the sashimi market. Um, and it's um, it's a convenient way to eat, um, and obviously very popular by the number of rows that you see in in shops that contain tuna. Yeah, it is a very easy way to eat tuna straight out of a can. I'm going to flick over to you, Gran, and ask you a question that's come in. What happens to the fish that doesn't get sold? Look, we will, one, um, most of all of our fish get sold anyway. Um, but if there is anything left over, it will go to the lobster fishermen. It will go into the community garden. So it's um, one of those things that it's very minimal waste that we have. That's excellent. So it's giving back. So we're not wasting anything. We're putting it back either to nourish our soil or to put back in the ocean to feed the lobsters. Lobsters, yeah. <laughs> the lobsters must be happy with a free tuna meal. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, okay, I've got another question that has popped up. So Phil, how long do tuna live for? Uh, most tuna live for around up to around 12 years. At, that depends. Um, it varies a little bit from species to species. Um, some of the smaller tunas sort of become reproductive at around two years of age, um, where others such as southern bluefin tuna aren't reproductive until around seven or eight years of age. So we've really got to be mindful about how we manage stocks, um, just understanding the recruitment in the fishery and those differences between the species. But generally, yeah, anywhere between about 10 to 12 years for most of the species. Wow, so they can get pretty old for a tuna and really big too. They're just, they're such an incredible fish. They must be, they are definitely an apex predator of our ocean, which means tuna sit at the top. They're one of the biggest fish and they eat 
some of the smaller fish. And if we take out too many tuna, like Phil was talking about before, we have to manage the tuna because if we take out too many tuna from the top as an apex predator, then other species of fish that the tuna eat things like herring and sardines and some other things, their numbers could get out of control. So if we look after the top species, then the rest of our ocean should stay really healthy too. Okay, I'm going to move on to our second thought starter. And this one is for Grant today. Now, over 30% of the fish that we buy in Australia and around the world is incorrectly labelled. That means sometimes we don't know what is even on our plates. We don't know what type of fish we're eating because they haven't labelled it properly. Now, the MSE, the Marine Stewardship Council certification, is tested by DNA analysis. It's got really cool science to it. And it's one of the best ways to make sure that your fish is labelled correctly. Now, Grant, why is seafood mislabeling a big problem in Australia? Look, I think it's the major thing is consumers aren't getting what they're paying for. Um, so within Australia, so 30% is mislabeled, but then 70% of seafood eaten in Australia is actually imported from overseas. And not all imported seafood's bad. Um, but I think the problem is that you could have barramundi on the menu, but I think it's a, um, under labeling. So it could be barramundi, but they're not telling you where the species is actually from. And there's a lot of substitution that go in with that as well. So with the MSC, you look for that blue fish kick and you know that that fish is what the label actually says. And for anyone that doesn't know, that MSC blue tick label is the one right beside Grant's head there. It has a little tick and a blue fish. And that way, you know that you're getting the most sustainable seafood put right in your belly and it's doing great things for the environment as well. Now, Grant, you touched on the fact that sometimes we don't know what kind of seafood we're eating. And one of those I know is fish and chips. We all eat fish and chips. A lot of us do. And when we go and buy fish and chips, what is the fish that we're actually eating? Because there's a lot of different fish species in our ocean and it never tells us what it is. No, definitely not. And that's one of the examples that people see fish and chips and just buy it. Um, it could be bassa from overseas. Um, there are some really good fish and chip shops and they're the ones that will actually advertise what species they're using. Um, but yeah, it could be anything from Bassa, Barramundi. Um, you can get flathead, some of the better fish and chip shops. But it's important that you ask the questions to the people running the businesses. Where is it from? Where is it sourced from? Um, and yeah. then it builds that accountability. Exactly. So would you say to everyone listening now, the best thing that they could do is when they buy fish is to actually ask what type of fish it is? Definitely, definitely. You need to ask the questions. And if the person serving you don't know, ask them to go and ask someone that knows. Um, everyone really needs to know exactly what's going on. Um, and I think the more pressure you put on these fish and chip shops, um, the more of them that will actually have to follow by the rules. Absolutely. So you guys heard it from Grant there. Next time you go to buy fish and chips with whoever you're with, make sure you ask them what type of fish it is and see what answer you get. You might be a little bit surprised. Uh, Phil, I want to ask you, Grant said that some of our fish species that we eat in Australia is actually imported. So it means it comes from another country. It's brought into Australia. What happens to the tuna that you catch? Do we eat your tuna here in Australia or does that get sent to another country? Um, it can be quite seasonable, but um, for the most part, we send about 75% of our fish to the US and Japan. There's really strong markets for that high quality premium um, tuna, which has come from Australian waters because we have such a great reputation for, you know, sustainability and our impacts on the environment. So there is a great demand for our, um, our produce overseas. Having said that, we're increasing our markets domestically and COVID has sort of made us realise that we need to be selling more fish into Australia just to spread our risk of, um, of access to markets. So, you know, I, I guess when we're talking about mislabeling, 
There's also this thing about um, lesser quality tuna coming into Australian water, uh, coming into Australian shops from overseas, and that's something that we really need to to look into because it would be really good if people could support buying Australian caught fish because it supports Australian businesses and Australian families. Absolutely. So I guess, uh, Grant, we need to know what type of fish we're eating, but maybe we should also be looking for where it is caught from as well. Is that right? Oh, definitely. Definitely. It's one of those things, like I mentioned before, it could be barramundi, it could be tuna, but there's a lot of imported seafood. Um, so when you see king prawns on the menu, one, they might not be king prawns, but it's what country they're actually from as well. Um, we have a lot of barramundi in Australia, but we do also import a lot of barramundi into Australia. So it, it's, yeah, I can't stress enough how, how important it is just to make sure that you ask those questions. Absolutely. I have a question come, has come in, um, Phil. Someone, uh, someone from OLF Carrying Bar, the school, has asked, do you need a special type of rod to catch a tuna? And I guess they're talking about them catching it themselves, not you catching it commercially. <laughs> yeah, you need a pretty strong rod. <laughs> um, a, lot of, a lot of game fishermen who, who go after marlin and stuff like that, they'll quite often catch tuna while they're, they're, they're trawling around. So, yeah. Something like a 15 to 24 kilo stand-up rod with um, with the big overhead reel and some 50 or 80 pound line and a nice lure and uh, that's the way you'll catch yourself a tuna. But you've got to go a long way offshore for some of these bigger tuna species. So make sure you're in a big boat. <laughs> All right. So everyone needs to buy a big boat and a really expensive rod to go and catch tuna. <laughs> Maybe that's a uh, time for a, a birthday present or something. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask. Within the fishery itself, so and a lot of fisheries around the world, we have what's called bycatch. And if you don't know what bycatch is, when fishermen are trying to target a specific species, so maybe when they're just trying to catch tuna, quite often they accidentally catch other species as well. So it could be anything from other fish species. It could be dolphins or turtles or birds. Phil, what happens to bycatch? And is bycatch a bad thing in the tuna industry? Uh, there's probably two components to your question. There's what we call byproducts. So they're fish that are caught that aren't tunas that actually are commercially valuable. Things like mahi mahi and wahoo and stuff like that that are unmarketable. So they're a byproduct. Then you have your bycatch, which is your, your threatened species. So we um, part of my job is to implement strategies on boats to stop us from catching things like seabirds and turtles and stuff like that. So we use all of these different um, mitigation tools like tory lines and circle hooks and, and line cutters and de-hookers to make sure that if we accidentally catch one, that we can let the, let it go um, if it, and hopefully it, it, it flies off or swims off safe and sound. Um, our, our record globally with bycatch is fantastic compared to other countries that don't have that, that same level of regulation and requirement to use these devices on their boats. Right, so there's ways to mitigate, so to stop from any other species being caught accidentally, which is great. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Right. Um, Grant, do you ever get um, any bycatch or the byproduct, as Phil was talking about, the ones that can be sold that can be sold in your shop, or do you? Does anyone ever try and sell it to you from the boats? Um, look, we do get it. Um, so we'll get the mahi mahi and things like that that the fishermen are actually targeting for. Um, but yeah, anything that we use, um, we'll make sure one that we've got to buy from the correct suppliers. Um, so we just can't buy fish off anyone down the harbour fishing. Um, we've got to make sure that everything's um, regulated. That way that we can ensure that the catch rates and the, the, the data that the scientists are actually using is correct, uh, correct data. That's great. So that means that the scientists can still look after the ocean and that flows on from the fishermen all the way to the shops, all the way to people's houses. I love that. Um, Phil, a tuna in danger of becoming extinct? No. No, so as I said, there's a really comprehensive science management um, regime around them and they're being managed to, to very sustainable levels. 
especially inside Australian waters. There have been incidents of overfishing in the past for, past for some of your, your larger Atlantic bluefin tuners. And at one stage, our southern bluefin tuner was in a fair bit of trouble as well, but they've been managed back to a sustainable level now. And I think the world understands that we need to make sure that we're fishing sustainably because the world's getting bigger and there's more demand on protein. So things need to be managed properly to make sure that you know, really valuable commercial species like tunas are there for generations to come. Great. And what are there any predators of tuna besides humans? Does anyone else eat tuna? Yeah, so uh, some of the smaller tunas I was talking about before, they're predated by seabirds and stuff like that. Um, when you get to tuna of the size that we commercially catch, um, they are predated on by larger sharks. Um, and uh, toothed whales is another issue. Um, often we catch a lot of tuna and they come up and they've been bitten in half by animals that you know, must be massive because we're talking about 50, 50 kilo tuna that just come up with just the head. So there's some pretty scary things out in that ocean. Um, but yeah, tunas are predated on by sharks and to a lesser extent, toothed whales. So they're not- Wow, they must be. Yeah, that, that must be a big shark eating that big tuna just to leave its head. That would not be fun to be swimming with that shark. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have a few more questions that have come in. Um, Grant, do you eat a lot of fish yourself or, or are you just sick of it because you sell so much of it? No, I love fish. Um, my whole family does. My boys, I should be watching today. Um, they love fish. So, look, it's such a great protein to eat. Um, so good for you. Um, easier to prepare. Um, one of the best ways for tuna is just eating it straight raw. Uh, a little bit of soya sauce. It's, uh, yeah, beautiful. Absolutely. And what would have to be your favourite fish species to eat? Look, I think tuna would up, be up there. Um, my favourite way is um, either raw or you just lightly, lightly coat it in sesame seeds, quick pan fry. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say tuna's up there. Excellent. And I have uh, one of our top voted questions is tuna is delicious. Are, are the kids right? Phil, do you think tuna's is delicious considering you're out there catching it? <laughs> Yeah, uh, look, tuna's really good. Keeping it simple, like Grant said, just with some soy and wasabi um, is really, really nice too. Um, it's really good for you. It's really healthy for you. And if you eat it in moderation, things like mercury and, and stuff like that aren't, aren't an issue. So, you know, um, and if you haven't tried it before, you know, outside of a traditional, just eating it out of a can, it's really, really interesting, really interesting textures. And um, yeah, it's definitely worth a try. Absolutely. Well, Grant and Phil, I want to say big thank you to you both for all of your knowledge and wisdom on Tuna today. It's been great. And everyone at home, you can make sure that you actually ask the questions when you buy fish. So whoever you go and buy your fish with, make sure you ask what type of fish it is, where it was caught and even how it was caught. And that way we can protect our, all of our seafood species for the future. Thank you to our guest speakers today, Grant and Phil, and to our host, Laura. And a special thank you to everyone who wrote in with your science questions. Uh, this event was hosted by the Marine Stewardship Council's education program, Saltwater Schools. And if you'd like to learn more about our oceans, sustainable fishing and food for the future, or even want to get some of the questions that we didn't get around to answering today answered by an expert, please get in touch with us or have a look at our website, there's lots of free learning resources and lesson plans there. Our next Q&A session will be held on Friday, the 20th of August at 1.30 p.m. in Sydney and the East Coast and at 11.30 on the West Coast. Um, fishing in Antarctica is the topic of this next session and we're going to learn all about the strange and wonderful sea life that live in the sub-Antarctic, such as the Patagonian toothfish or the emperor penguin. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye.